So I will tell you a bit about the brain deficits in ADHD, and then I'll tell you a little bit of the medication and what kind of limitations medication has. And then I will tell you about our neurotherapies, where we try to actually target, we spend like 20 years um, investigating in the brain abnormalities in ADHD, and we have very clear targets and areas which we know are not functioning so well. And so we target those areas with brain therapies, yeah? and I will talk a bit about that. As you probably also know, those ADHD symptoms like inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsiveness, they're behavioral features which are normally distributed in the population. So it's not like schizophrenia where you either have it or you either have hallucination or you don't. So there are people who are more impulsive, some people more reflective. And we know that they diminish over time, so the older the child, the less running around, the more able to concentrate, and the more reflective, even teenagers are more positive than others. So because of this, uh, ADHD children of course behave like younger children, and it has been argued since the 50s that ADHD children may have a delay in brain maturation. And this is precisely what the last 20 years of brain imaging have shown uh, to be true. So I just want to briefly say something about imaging techniques. So MRI is the imaging technique with the best spatial resolution. So if you want to know where in the brain are the deficits, then this is the best technique. There are some other imaging techniques like EEG, which you may have come across, electroencephalography, which is, has a very good temporal resolution. So you know very much, in, in, in terms of milliseconds, you can know when in time something happens in the brain, but you do, the spatial resolution is very bad, so you only really have a vague idea of where in the brain it was happening, and you cannot look at areas which are below the cortex. So MRI is the best technique, and it's the only imaging technique which can measure the structure of the brain, like the hardware. It can measure the structure of the brain and the function, like the software, you know, the activity in the brain. All the other methods can only measure the activity of the brain, but not the structure of the brain. So that's why MRI also has been used over the last 20 years in psychiatry to understand what areas are not normal in children with, with ADHD. So MRI, just to say very briefly, it's totally non-invasive, it doesn't hurt, it doesn't have any side effects, it's a huge magnet, and what happens, the, the protons in the brain which are in the liquid, like blood or the... the um, other liquids. They are lying in parallel to the magnetic field. Yeah? And then um, a radio frequency is emitted and then they flip out of the, of the 45 or 90 degrees out of phase and then they flip back. So different areas in the brain have different water content, so different number of protons, and they flip back in different ways. And that's how they emit a different magnetic signal. And these differences in magnetic signal can then be reconstructed into a high resolution structural image of the brain. It's very technical and, and, and complicated, but um, this is basically what happens. In fMRI neurons, so in fMRI you measure the brain in vivo while the child does tasks, like an attention task. In fMRI, the areas which are more active, they need more glucose and more oxygen and the brain overcompensates and sends more oxygenated blood to these regions. And the oxygenated blood gives a better magnetic signal than the uh, deoxygenated blood. So the red blood gives better magnetic signal than the blue blood. So I will illustrate this later. But we know that ADHD children have problems in not everybody, and, and you have to be in mind that all the studies are based on group statistics. So as a group, they're impaired in several uh, functions, but that doesn't mean every child is impaired in every function. Some children have more problems with one domain, others not with other domains, other children are not impaired. So, but what has been found, the areas which are most, where they're most impaired are working memory, especially visual spatial working memory, which means holding information online for a certain time, like remembering a telephone number for a few minutes, that's working memory. Or in addition, which relates to poor self-control. So ADHD children have more problems with controlling their behavior. And this can be measured in the lab in tasks where you inhibit the motor, you have to inhibit the motor response. 
So you press a, a button to a go signal and you have to inhibit the button press to a no-go signal. So this ability to inhibit, you know, suddenly to withhold your response, that's more difficult for ADHD children. Another problem we have is with concentration, of course, and in the, uh, in the lab you can measure it in terms of sustaining attention or vigilance. Another domain which is often still neglected is timing. So ADHD children have problem with timing, and if you think about it, impulsive people do things prematurely, too early in time, and they don't consider the consequences of their act. So they act in the moment and the spur of the moment, without thinking what happens later. And of course this has to do with problems with forward thinking, thinking of the future. And all these functions are actually mediated by the frontal lobe, which is one of the latest areas to develop in the brain. And the frontal lobe is also important for this forward thinking, you know, thinking of the future consequences. So I think children live more in the moment. And they have also more problems with waiting, and it has been shown that this is related to the fact that when they have to estimate time, time is time intervals, for example, they overestimate. So time is a bit more subjectively elongated, it's more insufferable for people who are impulsive. So they find it more difficult to wait. So for example, in tasks where you have to choose uh, whether you want a small reward now or a larger reward later, an ADHD child may go more for the small reward now. While someone is more reflective, of course, we go for the later reward because it's bigger and, and it's better. But you have to, of course, then keep in mind the future. You know, to think of the bigger reward in the future, that that is better than the present reward. And if you don't care about the future, you go for the thrill of the moment. This has also been found to be impaired in people with drug abuse. And it may be related to the fact that, of course, substance abuse is linked to ADHD. So in fMRI, what we do is the child sits in the MRI scanner and, well, he, he lies, this normally doesn't sit, so he, his head goes under here, there is a mirror, and he sees a computer get task. And he does the task with the button press, so in this example, for example, he did a task where he had to inhibit a motor response, and then we look at the areas which are activated uh, when he does the task. So as I said before, um, So as I said before, this doesn't work, okay, never mind. So areas which are activated, they have a, get more red blood because they need more oxygen, more glucose, and then you can see they, they give a better magnetic signal and you can see these areas in, in sort of orange blobs. And then what we do is we compare control children with ADHD children and we look at which areas are not activated as much when they do an attention task or an inhibition task. And in this example, this is a key area uh, which is impaired in energy patients, which is actually the, the inferior from the cortex. So, I want to just very briefly um, tell you a bit, there have been hundreds of fMRI studies and I will just show you our latest meta-analysis. So in a meta-analysis, what you do, you pull together all the studies which have been done so far, and you look at which areas are most consistently abnormal in ADHD children compared to control children, if you pull all this data together and analyze all these other studies which are already published. So what we find is that Doing tasks where children have to inhibit a motor response or where they have to inhibit a distraction, we find that children with ADHD have less activation in this area here, which is the inferior frontal cortex, and the basal ganglia. So the basal ganglia is in the middle of the brain, and the frontal, re frontal regions connect with the basal ganglia. Different frontal regions connect with different parts of the basal ganglia and they form what we call frontal basal ganglia networks. They're also called frontal striatal networks. Yes, yeah, so we, this is a very consistent finding and we found it in several later meta-analyses. As you know, in science you have to always replicate your findings. If you find something and then you don't find it later on, it's a spurious finding. But if you find something and you find it again and again, which is called replication, then this is quite a robust finding. 
So this is a very robust study. We found it in three meta-analysis. In other studies, there are also three other meta-analysis, so other people have also found this. So this is a key area which is impaired in ADHD, doing um, inhibition tasks, but also doing sustained attention tasks. Now another region which is impaired is this dorsal prefrontal region. So this is a bit more dorsal in the, in the frontal cortex. One is more inferior, one is more dorsal. It's called the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. And this area is also important for attention and it's also important for working memory. So this area is impaired doing when children with ADHD do attention tasks. So there are different <coughs> frontal abnormalities in these two different frontal regions and also together here with the basal area. So this frontal region and this basal area region is impaired doing attention tasks. We find abnormalities again in the inferior frontal cortex, so this is also a key area for timing. And the cerebellum. The cerebellum is here in the back of the brain, and this is an area which is very important for timing. So what this means is ADHD children have different abnormalities in different frontal regions, and different basic ganglia areas. Yes, so these are the basic ganglia in the middle of the brain. These are very important because they're also innervated by dopamine. And they're important for attention, timing, inhibition. They're also important for motivation. And we know that ADHD patients have less dopamine in the basic ganglia. And we know that similar medication, what it does, it does actually enhance dopamine in the basic ganglia and in the frontal lobe. And that's of course interesting because these two regions are the most impaired. So frontal region and basic annual regions. And different, as we see in the inferior frontal cortex here, important for timing, attention, inhibition. And this area here, important for working memory. These two networks are particularly impaired in ADHD patients. So if I go back to this schematic review, so this is maybe a bit complicated, but essentially it's just showing that the different frontal regions which connect to different parts of the basal ganglia and they mediate different functions. And what is of course also interesting to know that everybody knows that the frontal lobe is the latest region to develop. But what people don't know that the cerebellum and the basal ganglia develop at the same time and the cerebellum even later. So the cerebellum is the latest area to develop. So these children have problems with areas which develop very late in life, which is in line with the theory that these children have a delay in brain maturation because they're impaired in the areas which are the latest to develop and which also mediate these functions, uh, which we call executive functions. And if you think about it, uh, you can think about the frontal lobe like the CEO of the brain. Yeah, so this is the, the person who top-down manages all the functions in the brain. And different parts of the frontal lobe, as it said, are immediate different functions. So for example, the cognitive ones which I just showed you are the ones which are most impaired in ADHD, which are important for attention, time, and nutrition. But then we also have some limbic parts in the frontal lobe. They, in, they uh, top down control emotion, emotion functions. And of course ADHD patients also have problems with emotional dysregulation and control of emotions and pathogens. So there's some emerging evidence that those affective networks are also impaired. And there's some evidence that those motor networks are impaired in relation to the hyperactivity. So different parts of the motor cortex connect to different parts of the basic ganglia, and those networks, they mediate motor behavior. So the most consistent findings of in ADHD have been impairments in those cognitive networks. So these here, which involve the inferior frontal cortex and the dorsal frontal cortex. Yeah? So these blue regions, these are areas which are enhanced in activation in ADHD patients compared to controls. And this region here, the posterior cingulate precuneus, this is an area which is part of the default mode network. And the default mode network, this is a network which is activated when we do nothing. And what happens if we do nothing? We have random thoughts coming into our brain. We call it the mind, mind wandering or mental clutter. And if you have to concentrate and do a task, you have to switch off your mind wandering. Yeah? So everybody has to do that. And we know that the older you are, the better you're able to switch off your mind wandering. So little kids, they have problems with, with heavy, thick, all the random thoughts which come to you. 
But even now, if you listen to to my talk, so if you have some minds, uh, some random thoughts coming, if you think of what you're going to cook for dinner later, then you will not be able to pay attention to my talk because you will miss some bits because you might wonder. We all mind wonder all the time. Yeah, everybody has this problem. And we know also that people who meditate have better ability to control the mind wonder because meditation is about reducing your thinking. But children with ADHD have this problem that they have more mind wandering than normal children. Yeah? So they have more problems with switching off their mind wandering. So they, are, they have too many thoughts coming into the brain which I find difficult to switch off. And this causes problems with attention. So this is, uh, yeah, can be illustrated in a study where we had three, diff three difficulty levels of an uh, attention task. And if the task is very easy, you can have some mind working. Yeah? But if the task is really, really difficult, you have to switch off your mind working. Otherwise, you have attentional lapses and you're not concentrating. So the normal children, what they do, the more difficult the task is, the more activate the stores of frontal attention region, and the more they switch off this default mode, this mind wandering region. Yeah? And you can see it here on the graph. I'll make it a bit bigger. So, yeah, so you can see this very nicely. The more difficult the task, the more the, the control children enhance the frontal lobe activity, and the more they switch off this mind wandering. Yeah? And if you look at the ADHD children, what they do, they do the exact opposite. So the more difficult the task, the less they activate this frontal attention region. Yeah? And the more they increase this mind wandering. So it's almost like giving up in the most difficult condition, and they have too much mind wandering coming in. And don't switch it off, and, and also don't switch on this task relevant region. So there is a clear correlate in the brain for why they have attention lapses. Yeah, they have too, too much mind wandering regions activated, and they don't are deactivated, and they have too less activation of task relevant areas. And now I want to talk about the structure of the brain. So what I told you before was the function. So the brain in, in action while they do attention tasks or intuition tasks. So the functioning of the brain. Now the structure is like the hardware. So that's the, the volume, you know, the structure, the, 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 the size of the brain. But there was a very important study from the National Institute of Mental Health which was the first study to show that children of ADHD have a delay in the normal maturation of the brain. Yeah? So this is a study which shows, this is showing your areas of the brain which are delayed by more than two years. Yeah? And you can see the entire frontal lobe is delayed by two years. And but also areas, pride lobe here, the temporal areas, they are important for attention as well. So these areas are also delayed. So they have, in fact, a delay in brain maturation. And this was an important study because it was the first study to show that really it's true they are not just you know, naughty children, but they have a delay in the normal maturation of the brain. And we have recently done meta-analysis, again, you know, pooling together all the studies. And we looked at not just the cortical areas, what I showed you before was a study where they only looked at the cortex, so the cortex is here, yeah, and, but subcortical areas are deep in the brain. And MRI has the advantage that can, it can look at those deep brain regions. So if we looked at the whole brain, we, we want to see which area is most impaired. And what we find is the frontal lobe, and these are two studies that is showing the same results, but I just want to show that this is again replicated a replicated finding. So we find it again two years later with bigger numbers. In the last study, we had 1,280 children, so this is really quite a large study. So the area which is smaller in ADHD patients, apart from the frontal lobe, which we already know is abnormal, is also the basal ganglia. Yeah? So the basal ganglia are smaller in volume. And the basal ganglia, as already said, you know, they are, of course, form part of this frontal basal ganglia networks which we've shown are also reduced in function. Yeah? So these areas are not working very well when ADHD children do the tasks of attention or inhibition, but they're also smaller in structure. And of course, these two correlate. So if you have areas which are not properly developed, you also cannot recruit them as well as normal children because they're not yet as developed. Yeah? So this is really consistently showing these frontal basic networks are impaired in ADHD patients. So 
So this is a, a, a big effort all across the world where people collect data on imaging and genes all across the world from all the labs who've done MRI studies. And there are different working groups in every major psychiatric disorder. Yeah, we are part of the ADHD working group, which are the light blue ones. And so within this group, we've collected data across 23 centers of the world. And this includes data from North America, Brazil, UK, of course, uh, many European countries, Russia, China. And this is really the largest study, which we published last year. And what we found is, again, what we found is we just replicated this finding again that the basal ganglia are indeed smaller in ADHD patients. And the cortical analysis we have not yet published, but I can tell you we find frontal areas also that we get. So we replicate this finding that frontal areas and basal ganglia areas are smaller in ADHD patients. But what you need to bear in mind also that the findings the, the, the differences are small, yeah? There are about 2% differences. So it's not like they have massive abnormalities in the brain. They have very small subtle abnormalities, which seem to be large enough to cause problems, but they're small, yeah? So it's not huge. And you have to also be in mind that all the studies are based on group statistics. That means some children will have more abnormalities and other children will have normal brains. They are children with ADHD of normal brains yeah, or normal activation. So in, in a group statistics, you always have the people with the worst abnormalities dragging down the group. You know. So, but if you look at if you look at how many overlap with healthy control children, there are always some children who will overlap. Yeah. So it doesn't mean every child with ADHD has abnormalities, but it also means some children with ADHD have more abnormalities than two percent because this is just a mean and some have less, yeah? But in, total, in general, these are small differences. So this is not uh, like a neurological disorder where you have massive brain deficits. It's a small difference. The other area which this group would be found is actually limbic areas. And the limbic system is important for motion processing. Yeah, and of course this is, is interesting because we know now that ADHD patients also have emotion dysregulation problems. And the limbic system is here and important for motion processing. The, the findings show that it is not a mess, of course, ADHD R is characterized by abnormalities in the structure and the function of the brain. And the areas which are most impaired are the basic anemia regions and frontal areas. And within the frontal regions, the inferior frontal cortex is one area which has most consistently been found to be less, less uh, working less well. So they recruit this area less because it is less developed. And they have problems with switching off this mind wandering. We do. So medication, of course, is one of the best drugs we have in psychiatry because 70% of patients respond to stimulant medication. This is, uh, in fact, one of the best uh, drugs. Uh, there's no other drug in psychiatry where 70% of patients respond to. However, uh, it has, of course, some side effects. At the most Difficult side effect, I think it stunts the growth. So people grow less than they would according to their parents' height. And what stimulant cells is it blocks dopamine transporters in the basal ganglia, and that leads to a release of dopamine. And of course, dopamine is important for attention, inhibition, uh, motivation, and that's how it improves behavior because it improves those dopamine levels which are smaller in ADHD patients. In the frontal lobe, it also enhances uh, noradrenaline, which is also a, a transmitter, with, which is very important for attention. So we, we've looked at the effect of stimulant medication on the function of the brain. So what does it do to the activity of the brain where in the scanner when ADHD children do a cognitive task? So again, we've done a meta-analysis of all the studies which were available at the time in 2014. And what we found is stimulant medication, in fact, most consistently enhances the activity of this right interfrontal region, which is, of course, a key impairment in ADHD. And this is, of course, interesting because it also enhances the activity of the basal ganglia, which is this region here. Yeah, so this is the frontal cortex, the basal ganglia. So, of course, 
This is explaining why it works so well, because these frontal-based ganglia regions are the ones which are not working well. So if they're enhanced by stimulant medication, then that's of course a good thing. And furthermore, stimulant medication it switches off the mind wandering. So again, it has a key effect on those key problems in ADHD. And I find this very surprising because stimulant medication was invented by chance. If you know the story, do you know the story? I'm not sure I tell you. Well, Leandro Panison, he worked for Siva Gaidi in Switzerland, and he developed methylphenidate. And it was used to enhance the blood pressure. So he, he, you know, in the 50s, everyone tried the drugs on themselves. So he tried it on himself, he found no effect. Then he gave it to his wife when they were playing tennis because she had very low blood pressure. So he gave it to her, and then he found she was actually winning him and her concentration was much better. So then he thought, okay, this, this looks like we could use it for ADHD children. It improves your attention. There was a pure chance finding, like most drugs in psychiatry, are found purely by chance. But what is interesting that this drug, which was found by chance, nevertheless actually is targeting the key abnormalities in ADHD. And that's why it works so well in 70% of patients. So, of course, myself and others, we have all been worried to give stimulant medication to a developing brain, yeah, to children who are, whose brain is still developing, because we thought we interfere with the normal neurotransmitters, and we know in mice, if you give them very early stimulant medication, it messes up the dopamine system, and then they get depressive kind of anxiety problems. So everybody has been, not everybody, but most people have been worried that uh, to give drugs to children who are developing without actually knowing what it does to the brain. And I think it's still, of course, a worry. But most studies, I have to say, the latest studies have found that similar medication has no effect on the structure of the brain. So it improves the function of the brain, but it doesn't affect the structure in a positive or negative way. Yeah? So the, I have to say that there's only one study, which is a randomized controlled trial, which of course the gold standard method. And, but this study also found no effect. So they gave children with ADHD medication and they tested them for a year. And they tested another group with placebo and the stimulant medication had no effect on the structure of the brain. So this is good news. It does not interfere with normal brain development. So it doesn't damage the structure of the brain. Now, PET studies, these are the best, uh, positron emission tomography is another method where you measure the chemistry of the brain. So we've seen the structure and the function, but the chemistry of the brain is of course very interesting in psychiatric disorders where we know there are some neurotransmitter abnormalities, so there are some biochemical abnormalities. But this can only be done in adults because you have to inject the radioactive substance, which then binds to whatever you want to measure. So studies have looked at the dopamine transporter. And of course people look at the dopamine transporter because we know that stimulants block dopamine transporters in the basic area, and that's how they enhance dopamine. So people have thought there must be something wrong with the dopamine transporters. Yeah? And so what we found in our meta-analysis of all the, the studies is that the dopamine transporters are indeed smaller in medication than in patients. Yeah? And this makes sense because they have less dopamine. So dopamine transporters, they take up the dopamine. Yeah, that it needs to be taken up and then it needs to be released and then taken up. So the dopamine transporters have this job of taking up dopamine. But if they are... The, so if you have less dopamine in your brain, then you need less dopamine transporters. So this was logical. But what we found, and this was not... Uh, it was very surprising. We found that people who are, who are medicated long term, yeah, these were adults. So these are all the controls, these are the studies. Three studies actually exist, and they have found them to be abnormally high. So what does it mean? It means that if you give an adult stimulant medication long term, they go up. Yeah? So the brain adapts. So the brain adapts to the drug. I hope this is sort of clear. Is that clear? So basically, stimulant medication blocks dopamine as well, so you have more dopamine. Yeah? So this is fine, so the child works much better, everything is, is great, the school performance is better. But 
what the brain does. For the brain, this is too much dopamine. The brain is not used to so much dopamine. So the brain adapts and builds up more dopamine as well as to get rid of all this extra dopamine. Yeah? And if the dopamine of photos are too high, it has been shown that this is related to poor attention. Yeah? So this is not good. And what is also interesting, of course, that in line with these studies, there is, was this large multi-center study. Many people may know the NTI study. There was a multi-center study across America where they found that stigma medication is better than behavioral treatment. And this study was influential because since then, you know, it's very established, stigma medication is much better than behavioral treatment. However, they followed them up after years and years, and they found that stigma medication is better after one or two years, but not after three, six or eight years. Yeah. So the effect is, is, seems to be going gone. So children who are taking medication are not better than children who are not taking medication after three, six or eight years. Yeah. So these people also argue there must be a brain adaptation, which is in line, of course, with our imaging studies. Yeah, so the brain adapts to the drug. And we know this from stimulant abusers. People who abuse drugs, the brain adapts to the drug. So they need more and more higher doses to get the same thing out of the drug. This is well known for cocaine abusers or stimulant abusers, uh, the brain adapts. So if stimulants don't work longer term, then we need alternative treatments. Yeah? And that's why we're looking at the moment, everybody's looking at alternative treatments. Cognitive training, fatty acids. We didn't find anything with fatty acids. And, uh, you know, behavioral treatments do not work very well in ADHD. So what we are doing now is we are, we are wanting to target those brain abnormalities. Because this is the whole point. You know, we did imaging to understand which areas are not working well. And then we can target these regions with treatment, which is targeted to these areas. Yeah? So the reason, of course, why we prefer or want to test brain therapies is because drugs have side effects. They don't work longer term. So we need something else, which is working longer term. So I've shown you this area is consistently reduced in activation. So this is a good target. You know, we spent 25 years investigating the brain. We know this area is not working well. So we can try to improve this region with brain therapies. And what we also, I also showed you, this area is not working well, but this area is enhanced with human medication. So we can mimic the stimulant effects or without the side effects if we do something else to enhance the activity of this region or without the drug. So there are two ways we can modify this area. Yeah? One is neurofeedback. And I will explain what this is. But in, in neurofeedback, we teach the child to enhance activity of this region by himself, yeah, via neurofeedback. And the other way is brain stimulation. Yeah, so we can stimulate this area with a, a little electrical activity, and at the same time, the child does some cognitive training task, and that one, by that we can also enhance activity of this region. Because we have done a little proof of concept study, and of course our theory was is if we teach children to self-regulate this activity, then this has a better effect than a, a, a longer term effect than a drug. Because you know, if you give a stimulant today, tomorrow the effect is gone, or even the evening. Yeah. However, neurofeedback with EG has shown longer term plastic effects up to two years. Now, the problem is EG neurofeedback has been around for 50 years, but the latest studies show it is not working. Yeah, the effect is very small. But fMRI neurofeedback is much better because it has a better spatial resolution and you can target those key areas which are normal. And the inferior frontal cortex, for example, you cannot target with EG because it's too deep in the brain and EG is far too superficial. So in neurofeedback, we do exact opposite what we've done before. So before, the child does a task with the button box, and then we look at which area is abnormal. Now we do the exact opposite. We teach the child, we ask him to enhance activity of this region, and of course the child doesn't know how to do that. So he does it by trial and error. He tries different things, but every time he enhances activity of this region, this rocket here is connected to this region, goes up in the sky. And if, the, if it decreases activity of the region, the rocket here goes down. So the child, by trial and error, 
moves his rocket here up and down, and then at one point, in the beginning nothing may happen, but we have seen, you know, all the children can do it. Uh, after a few sessions of eight minutes, the children can do it. And uh, of course, adults also can do it. But basically, the child tries to do something, and then he notices, okay, now it goes, the, the rocket is going up, so intuitively, something he's done with his brain has moved the rocket up. Then he knows to do this again and again. And this is how neurofeedback works, because the rocket here is connected in real time to the activity of the brain. Yeah, so it's really, it works like magic, it's pretty like magic. So you move a, a computer game with your brain, you play it with your game, which is fun. And children actually like it, and I, I like it because I love it. Because it's, <laughs> it's really magical. You know, you, you feel like a magician, you move something up and down, with your brain activity. So basically, this is what happens. So if they enhance activity of the right frontal cortex, this rocket here goes up in the sky. And then he moves further up, and the goal is to reach the space station. So he moves up in here. Uh, let me just show you a bit more. So he moves into the sky, sees some planets. And of course, if the, it, it doesn't usually go up like this, so it goes up and then it goes down a bit because they're trying, and then it goes, you know, down, up and down, up and down. But eventually, uh, hopefully, uh, they will reach the, the space station, and many people actually reach the end of the game. That's amazing. It's good. Yeah, this is, was done by a professional gaming artist. <laughs> so <laughs> this is a very professional game. So let me just show you the end. So he goes up here, and things happening. <laughs> and then he reaches the space station. And then he does some kind of... <laughs> so we've done a randomized control trial in very small numbers, 31 children, 12 to 17, and we had one group who had to enhance this interfrontal cortex, and then we had a control group who had to enhance another area in the back of the brain. So, and we, we looked, of course, at improvement of performance, of clinical symptoms, and longer term effects. So what we found is children with ADHD, in fact, can do it. Yeah, and when we did this study, no one had actually done this study in children, let alone children who have problems with self-regulation. But they can do it, and no one has the adults, they need four sessions. In ADHD, we find they need eight sessions. So after eight sessions of eight minutes, they actually start to upregulate this interfrontal region. Yeah, so they manage to activate this area. And we had about 11 runs of eight minutes. Furthermore, we found they could also do it at the end. At the end, we give them a session where we don't give feedback. So this is important because we need to, sh to, to see whether they can do it without the rocketeer moving. So the movie doesn't move. And, and this is to show that they actually have learned and can do it without the feedback. Because obviously, it can't be connected to scanner forever. <laughs> so as you can see, in the first session, they have a little activation after the 11 runs of eight minutes, they actually increase activity, and in the transfer session without the feedback, it's even more activated. So it worked very well. And when we looked at the performance, we found, in fact, a reduction of clinical symptoms of 20%. This is about the medium effect size. But what was most interesting, that after almost a year later, 11 months, we found a reduction of 26%, and the effect size was very large. This is an effect size of one is the same effect size like medication compared to placebo. So this was a really large effect size, but what is most interesting, of course, medication wouldn't work 12 months later if you stop giving it. So this really confirms the theory we have that this is a longer term plus effect. You know? So it changes the brain in a longer term way and actually has uh, even you know longer term consolidation effect because the effect was better at the months than immediately after the feedback. It seems like the brain needs some time to actually, you know, increase activity and improve behavior. So basically we can say our feasibility study shows yes it works, ADHD children can do it. They can self-regulate the brain. It's related to symptom reduction. We also found they have enhanced attention 
performance and attention task, and we found they had better brain activation after compared to before, and an inhibition task, and we found no side effects. So now we're doing, <coughs> we want to replicate the findings in a larger study where we're looking for 100 ADHD children, and we also include a placebo condition. It's not a placebo effect. We don't think it's a placebo effect because the brain changes were related to the behavioral changes. If you find this kind of correlation, it's unlikely it was a placebo effect. So if it's a placebo effect, they wouldn't be related. But nevertheless, you know, you have to always double test them. You also have to replicate it. You cannot just simply keep going to the clinics and say, look, we have a new treatment. We need to test it again in a larger group. And so in this study, which uh, Marion is here with section uh, We are looking at 100 boys with ADHD, and we have an active group who has again to enhance this right in the frontal cortex, and then a control group which uh, is getting sham. So sham means you get feedback from another person which is not related to your activity. Now, however, it's, although it looks you know not very nice if your child is in the sham condition, however, Studies have shown that chunk feedback also has an effect because you're trying to self-regulate the brain and just trying to self-regulate the brain enhances self-regulation brain areas. So this is quite interesting and also it's an attention training because you're staring at this rocketeer and try to regulate the brain. So this is what we do. So it's a double-blind study. So the researchers are blind and the parents and the children are blind. So I'm the only one who knows which condition they are in, but I'm not telling everybody, of course. And the inclusion criteria are boys between 10 and 18. They have to be, they can be on medication, but if they're on medication, they have to be on the same medication for the whole time of the study. So you cannot change it in the middle of the study because that would be confirmed. And we exclude comorbidity with other major psychiatric disorders like autism, but uh, we allow, uh, you know, mild depression or anxiety, and, um, of course, neurologic illness we also exclude. And contributions <coughs> to MRI, for example, braces. So in MRI, you cannot have metallic uh, elements in the body. So that would be dangerous. So this is the, uh, this is the study design. So we do very thorough assessment <coughs> of all sorts of clinical measures. We check for comorbidity with autism and other disorders. And then we look at a large battery of cognitive tests and of inhibition, attention, timing, because you expect them to improve after the treatment compared to before. And then they have three, uh, four scanning hours where they do the neurofeedback training itself. And at the end, we assess them again after the training, a day later, and then after uh, six months to see whether the effects are longer term, whether they're lasting. Now, the brain stimulation is another way to modify this area. And most people know more about TMS, <coughs> yeah, because TMS, that's brain malignant stimulation, is used with depression. I won't go into details, but basically, the studies on TMS have not been very promising. There have been four studies in ADHD, and uh, one study found something, and two of studies and others found, found nothing. And then there was an open label study, but where you don't know whether it was placebo or not. So it has not been too promising. It's also not so good for children because TMS actually does hurt a bit on the on the scalp, so it's not very comfortable. However, what we're using is, is a new one. It's called transcranial direct current simulation, and this induces a very small electrical current to the brain, to certain brain areas. And we know in an electric current, it's very small, one myoampere. So that's not much, it doesn't hurt, no side effects, and, and it doesn't, I mean, apart from a small tingling maybe under the area of stimulation, but uh, they're also rare, so it's quite safe, although it sounds terrible, but it's <laughs> very safe. So we know that in an electrical current there's an anode and a cathode, and the anode increases the excitability of the neurons which are underneath. So with the anode, you can actually increase activity of the underlying neurons. With the cathode, you decrease the activity of the underlying neurons. So this is a good way to actually enhance or downregulate regions. And it's used in, in epilepsy, for example, to downregulate the areas which have a focus, which are overactive. 
And it's been used in children with epilepsy, and it's been used in many, many other ch healthy children. It's been used in children, and never sort of side effects have been found. So we use this helmet just because it's more comfortable, but we stimulate also just one region. So what is good about this method is it actually has shown that this can lead to longer term connections between neurons. So it can lead again to neuroplastic effects. And in healthy adults, it has shown that after the, the study which has tested the longest period was one year, and they actually found that the simulation improved cognitive performance and that lasted one year. And you can even buy it on the internet. So here there is this thing called Focus. You can buy it for 250 pounds on the internet. And I would not recommend it though because it's actually sold for normal people and there are many people who use it. If they go to have an exam, they use this simulation to simulate certain front errors. But there is not yet enough research in children that, that I, I would not recommend it. Also it has been shown that this works better on people who have uh, not, whose brain is working so well than in healthy people. So it's better to use it actually. It's more justified to use it in children with age who have problems with activating certain areas. Because if your brain is also already activating with the optimal level, mm -hmm. then you know you may actually damage your brain rather than improve something. So it's not really good that they're selling this on the internet with <coughs> also no thorough research. But you don't know how it's uh, people like to make money out of their patients. <laughs> so what has been shown is that when you do a cognitive task, and that's why also it's used often with that tablet, for example. So if you do a cognitive task, you activate already the areas which are mediating the cognitive task. And on top of that, to stimulate the brain region, you double the effect. So it boosts the effect. Now, because cognitive training also can increase the activity of the areas which are mediating those functions which you're training. But when you then give them an extra push with the brain stimulation, that is shown to double effect. And of course, children with ADHD, they may need this extra push because they have problems with active in this area. So if you give them this extra push, that's the idea behind. Um, and I, in fact, in fact, uh, there have been nine studies already in ADHD because it's very promising. And two studies have looked at clinical symptoms and they found actually clinical symptoms to be improved, but inattention especially was improved after the simulation, after and seven days after, after simulation, and this study two weeks later. Uh, because no one has looked longer than two weeks. All the other studies just looked at cognitive, cognitive performance. So this gave them a simulation and then they looked at whether the performance was improved. But they found improved performance of frontal stimulation on reaction time, on motor inhibition, on ability to inhibit distraction, on working memory. So all the typical functions which are impaired in ADHD actually improved when you stimulate this frontal region. So what we are doing is no, as you can see, not, none of the studies have combined it with cognitive training, so we think it's much better, and it has been shown in healthy adults that if you combine this with cognitive training, the effect is doubled, it's much better. So we combine this uh, the stimulation of the right hypofrontal cortex with cognitive training, and we're using a cognitive training game which was professionally developed by Yale University with the company, the gaming company. And uh, so this is quite engaging. I'll show you later a few examples. And we do 15 sessions of 20 minutes yeah, of one micron pair, which is very small. And as I said, it's perfectly safe. And the idea behind this is that if we train children on these training games, which train timing, ambition, working memory, concentration, sustained attention, and at the same time, we give them this extra push with the simulation then we double the effect and manage to enhance the activity of this region. And of course we also hope that the effect will be longer term. So, and these are the games, I'll show you a little example here. Yeah. Hello there, I am Captain Blue Letters. So it's sort of in the parallel team. We're uploading our ship, and we could use your And in this example, for example, they have to click on the button. you great. Some other monkeys, so this measures the equation, attention, selective attention, 
This is the word from memory task that you remember where the monkey went. Yeah. In this task, again, yeah, the measures of tension. You have to click on some and not to click on others. And uh, and uh, this is again a working memory task for which you remember who lives as a command and then of course if you could it it becomes more complicated and more, more hard as well. Yeah. And this again also measures inhibition and retention. So you can see they're quite fun to do. So this is a commercial game and what has been shown also in research uh, that cognitive training of working memory yeah, in ADHD, it does not transfer to general behavior, so that hasn't shown to work. But the recent studies have shown that if you train many functions, that is more likely to work. So training one function doesn't seem to transfer, but if you train multiple functions, then this is of course more, uh, more likely to generalize to daily behavior because in school, for example, you need many functions, you need working memory, you need to concentrate, you need to to do all these functions. So it has been shown that those studies which target multiple functions are more effective to improve ADHD behavior than those studies where you just train one single function, which mm -hmm. makes sense, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So we, we have 40 boys with ADHD and the active group gets the real stimulation and the control group gets the shown stimulation. So he gets stimulated for a few seconds and we switch it off. So people cannot tell the difference. So it's again double blind, so that we won't know, nobody will know. And we have 15 sessions of over three weeks. So they have to come every day for three weeks. And they get this, uh, you know, the stimulation, as I said, with the cognitive training. And the design is similar to the other study. We also test six months later. So the, the inclusion is exactly the same, like in the neural feedback. The only difference is like braces are okay, because, you know, we're not putting in the scanner. It's okay if they have mild ticks, which is not okay for the scanner, but it will be okay for our study. And of course, if claustrophobia is not a problem. Other than that, this is, these are the same uh, exclusion criteria. In history of migraine, we exclude because we can, if people have migraine, they can cause some headaches. But um, not, in, not in normal people. So again, we do a complex assessment before the study. Then they have 15 sessions. I say here 40 minutes, but the stimulation itself is 20 minutes. But between putting on the cup and so on, it can take 40 minutes. And they have to come every day for three weeks. And then we test them again after the study and six months later. And we also, in this study, also do a very little short EG uh, uh, of 10 minutes. So um, that's basically it. I just want to thank all the people who have been involved in the study and then thank you for listening for the long.